You are officially the first group we host in this environment. So thank you. Uh, uh, and to our surprise, many more of you came than we expected. So also, uh, thank you. I'm going to uh, very quickly just tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, and then if you want to know more about who we are, you'll have to ask one of my other employees that are here. Where's Ernie? Oh, back there. They're all standing back there. Uh, because the focus today is really about blockchain and, uh, and um, understanding blockchain. So Acronis SCS, uh, we are an off-the-shelf software company uh, focused on edge data security and, and cyber protection. We're headquartered here. We're not a branch here. Uh, this is our home base and this is our office. So uh, my support people are right here. Uh, my R&D people are right here. My sales and marketing people are right here, except for the guy who sells to federal government because they seem to want to sign the checks in DC. Uh, we are uniquely focused on state and local government. Uh, I did work for the uh, parent company. We're an independent subsidiary with our own board uh, for a number of years before uh, that actually is based out of Switzerland and sells all around the world, including the United States. So those of you who are not part of public sector, I'm more than happy to talk to you as well. Um, uh, we are members of 11 different organizations here, uh, mostly in Arizona, a few in uh, DC. Uh, this is intentional to really get to understand uh, how we can be part of this community and help Arizona uh, become the Silicon Desert that it wants to become. Uh, uh, I have today about 30 employees, 21% uh, are US veterans uh, here. Uh, so we're a very veteran supportive uh, environment. I actually have also three SkillBridge interns. For those of you who might not know what that is, it's a great program where the DOD sends uh, uh, transitioning members of the military to come and work in industry funded by the DOD. Uh, the only thing they can't do is sell to the federal government on my behalf. Uh, but besides that, uh, they can learn. And uh, it's been a great source of talent uh, as uh, well. Uh, we sell all over uh, public sector. Uh, with that, that's all I'm going to talk about. So if you are interested more about our company, about backup, recovery, cyber protection, edge, happy to talk about it. I'm going to introduce you to our key speaker. Now you might uh, wonder why a, uh, a cyber protection company uh, is associated with blockchain. Uh, the reason is because if you look at the future and how data will be managed, protected, uh, 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 taken care of, one of the technologies besides uh, AI and machine learning is blockchain that will be used to provide the transparency and uh, the uh, ability to authenticate and, and verify data uh, that you need to do to make sure that your digital lives are not compromised or false. Uh, we have started in blockchain with one small feature in our product around notarizing data. Uh, but there's a lot more that could be done. And uh, since I've gotten a lot of questions about it when I've been at, uh, walking around here, I thought my friend, uh, I invite my friend Le Hall to come and talk about it. He's the founder of a company called Chainstack based out of uh, Singapore. Uh, Chainstack is an infrastructure product that Le Hall will talk about later. He's uh, been in this industry, in tech industry, for over 20 years. I've worked with him for a number of years in. Uh, past companies, I always uh, uh, cherish his time uh, around uh, how he thinks about technology and simplifies that message. So hopefully, uh, Laurent will be able to provide some insight. Ask a lot of questions. I can tell you when the, uh, uh, what really got this started is when the president of the Senate asked me to explain blockchain, and I went down in flames. I, I, I just uh, could not explain it to her in terms uh, that she understood, and it had nothing to do with her, and everything to do with the fact that I, I just uh, I was too technical. And so hopefully the hall will help us. There you go, sir. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, I think you're going to have to deal with my voice a little bit because uh, I have a long flight here. 
You're also gonna have to deal with my accent. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I hope you can actually understand me. John said I'm, I'm coming from Singapore. Who, who has been to Singapore? All right, I'm amazed. Um, and uh, of course, I'm not from Singapore. Uh, you can guess. I'm French, and I'm trying to get rid of my French accent for a long time, but I can't. Um, it's the first time I come to Phoenix, uh, but it's not the first time I come to Arizona. And as I was uh, preparing for this trip and trying to understand uh, Phoenix um, a little bit more about the history, which uh, I, I like um, when I visit new places, I, I got to understand that the city was built around um, uh, five different um, areas that people call, call the five seas. Is, is that true? Yes. So it's interesting because Singapore was built around the five seas as well. But they're completely different. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the five C's here, if I remember, are climate, copper, uh, cotton, uh, and citrus. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> Singapore is credit card, <laughs> cash, <laughs> car, and country club. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. It's hundred percent true. You can you can look at it. You know, uh, probably in the Asian culture, you know, adding cash and adding cards and, and adding credit cards was equally important to, to you guys. So I thought the analogy was kind of interesting, so I thought I would share that with you. Um, I've been given the task in the next 40 minutes to try to explain um, what is blockchain and essentially how it can be used. And I think it's a very, very hard task uh, to do that in the next 40 minutes. Uh, but please help me. Help me out to make this interactive, and uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. If I, if I have the answer, I'd be happy to, to provide my opinion. Uh, and I also would love to thank um, Acronis SCS, Lindy, uh, who's back there, John, and of course, JPEG and the entire team uh, for helping us put this event together. That's really an amazing opportunity um, for, for me to share um, our vision about blockchain. So, um, blockchain is essentially a different ways to record transactions. Right? It's, it's very, very simple. Um, blockchain is one of the third terms being used to describe decentralized ledger technology. Having multiple ledgers to record the same transaction instead of having one ledger. Right? Most of the world we live in is organized around this idea that you know, our accounting system is going to record one transaction and the very same transaction is going to be recorded on another ledger mm -hmm. that is not connected. Right? That, that's how we operate. And in fact, most of the world we live in, and I'll come back to that, is very, very centralized. In some instances, um, it can create some issue, right? to reconcile this data or to create a single source of truth. Right? So that's the world we live in today, and we've been pretty good at managing it. Um, but some people came up with different ways of doing it. You have a second way of recording transaction, um, where most of the time um, a central authority is basically uh, at the center of how the transaction is being recorded. That's true for uh, state um, uh, authorities that basically look at how people um, uh, place transaction. Central banks, for instance, do that in the US and in many countries. And basically, you have this higher authority that decide whether the trans transaction is legitimate or uh, whether the transaction is a true transaction or not. Right? So that's the world we live in. You know, either two parties exchanging transaction or having a central authority to basically agree or define or validate how the transaction is being recorded and whether it's a valid uh, transaction. Blockchain offers a different uh, process. Blockchain offers the ability to record a particular transaction across multiple nodes or blocks and adding the ability for every block or every person owning these particular nodes to validate the information. So no one controls the information. You don't have one cent central uh, authority validating the transaction. But you have a group of people that in a combined way agree <coughs> that this transaction is a truth. Not me. Uh, that's, uh, this transaction is the truth and, and is validated and is authentic. And because blockchain is a way for people to record multiple transactions, it also has a very, very interesting attribute, which is called immutability. 
Immutability stands for permanent auditability of the chain. So if the transaction is being recorded today across multiple blocks, and as long as this chain will be operating, you basically have the ability to go back and prove that this transaction was the original or authentic transaction uh, that you recorded. And that introduced some really interesting use cases because the ability to be able to audit or validate transaction in long period of time is kind of interesting. It also causes some problem um, um, or potential issue if you want to forget some particular transactions that have been recorded. Right? You have a lot of people talking about this uh, recently. So that's what blockchain is. Blockchain is an algorithm and a consensus. An algorithm that records a transaction and a consensus that make basically um, set the rules of everyone transacting in this chain. And consensus could be different. In really in the way we assemble as human beings, we assemble as people, right? How you choose your friends or how you choose people you do business with. Sometimes you have rules, everyone is welcome. Sometimes you have no rules, right? And more rules, I'm sorry. Sometimes you have more rules, right? So only certain group of people can actually be uh, part of your circle or part of the people uh, you're going to be dealing with or, or doing business with. So that's what blockchain is. Any question on the basic concept? <coughs> yes? Yeah, who verifies the transactions? So that's a very good question. So every node verifies the transaction. So basically, the, the term blockchain comes from the fact that when the transaction is being recorded, it's being validated with the node um, uh, either next to uh, next to them or by all the nodes, depending on the consensus being chosen. Mm -hmm. Right? Can that cause confusion and delay? Because everyone is trying to. Of course, yeah, that's a very good point. So consensus, uh, some consensus tend to be very very slow, and I talk about this uh, because the level of validation and security is very high. So, for instance. Bitcoin, which arguably is probably the one protocol that everyone knows here, that is not extremely useful for enterprise, but every, uh, but very, very useful to transact and share um, digital value, is extremely slow, but extremely secure. Extremely slow, but extremely secure. Yeah? If yeah. an error would just uh, append to that answer, basically what blockchain is, like, uh, the institutions in the past typically had a third party, like an institution that would verify everything. Instead of trusting in an institution, essentially you trust a computer. Um, the algorithm in question is a SHA-256 algorithm, and basically what makes blockchain so great is that um, it's very hard to hack. So essentially, this network, as it grows in size, it gets harder and harder to hack into the entire ecosystem, and once you reach a critical mass, you can't stop it. So essentially, your competitors or your adversaries would need to spend a huge amount of money to sort of purchase the computational resources in order to crack that algorithm in broad daylight. Essentially, it's a third layer of the internet, a new paradigm of computing. And essentially, it, sh it uh, creates a sh fundamental shift in the power structure away from centralized institutions so that it's a more democratic technology. Well, I was trying exactly not to describe it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what Francis mentioned is exactly true for the one of you uh, that are interested in the, in the basic computation model. I, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, no, uh, my question was really uh, more surrounding if an error is made and you correct the error, does it correct itself throughout the entire chain? No, no. Today it doesn't. Yeah, you can't go back and change the blockchain. Uh, Which is a princi the principle of immutability. Mm -hmm. is basically the idea that it would be very, very hard. So the type of attack that Francis just described is if you have a network of nodes computing transactions together, okay, to make it super simple, um, uh, if 51% of the participants to this network would basically you know, change or try to change the way um, the transaction has been recorded, that would be called a 51% attack, and supposedly they would have more compute power than the 49% <coughs> remaining. Um, which is why he explains that basically if you have a very large network, it's very difficult to get 51% of the, of the network to go against you. So if I understand you correctly then, an error becomes <coughs> a mutation that continues. Yeah, but in uh, financial uh, models uh, and in accounting system, you can also have uh, 
uh, mistakes being made and basically transaction rectified uh, these mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yet the original transaction is still there in your system. So it's not uncommon to think you, you could work around it. But your error is recorded properly. And That's everybody true. can, <laughs> and everybody can and, see it. But and essentially you can track it. Uh, I think one of the interesting uh, one of the interesting points about what you mentioned, sir, is that is that the fact that you know there is a mistake is equally important. And the fact that you can communicate that a mistake was made is equally important. So the transparency and the traceability that you attach to it are important values in the blockchain. So Yeah, this is gonna be a naive question, but somebody's gotta ask it, I guess. Uh, it seems like when you add all of the, these additional parties to this, that it might be more parties that you could hack. But obviously, I think what you're saying is that's not true. More, more what? Sorry. More parties that you could hack. So the data is in multiple places rather than just one. Yeah. Is that not the case? Um, so actually, it becomes harder uh, because you're disseminating um, data across you know, a large number of nodes. And arguably, you, know, you guys, 21% of, of Acronis SCS are in the military. You know, if you have only one base, <laughs> And, and this base is being bombed or attacked. You know, it's only one place that you can go after. And that's a world we've been living in in the past um, um, few years. I mean, most of the, of the data that we record are basically in, central, in centralized location. So by disseminating information and encrypting this information across multiple locations, and multiple nodes being owned by different groups of people, you're basically mitigating the risk of being hacked or being you know, compromised uh, as one single location or as one single company or one single database. So all of the information is not in any one spot? So it depends um, the way the protocol records the information, but um, part of the information or hashes of the information is going to be available through, through you know, the network in some different fashion. You have networks where information is stored across the entire blockchain and networks and nodes, but you also have um, networks that are simpler with uh, a lesser level of securities where uh, information is being hashed and, and, and <coughs> shared or stored only in different locations and not throughout the entire blockchain. Different use cases for different momentum, depending on, on the level of security you need or depending on the level of scalability you need or speed uh, uh, to go back to your question. So, I mean, if it's just a matter of decentralizing and creating more data centers to make it more secure, <coughs> isn't Google and AWS already doing it? I mean, they have data centers all across mm -hmm. the globe. Yeah. And well, you can't just hack and destroy every single database and data centers. Yeah, uh, that's kind of true. Um, um, so I would answer uh, uh, in two ways. I mean, first, most of you, when you store data in Google, you store it in one location, not multiple locations. You have to pay to store it in multiple locations. And when you do so, you mostly store it in two locations. I mean, a large company might store it in three locations. Um, so it's not so much a physical integrity or the physical data center that you're looking at protecting. It's more the way um, the information is disseminated across the network, which is more interesting. Yep. So is blockchain important to my Amazon interaction? Um, I can think of multiple use cases where um, if you would want to make sure of the integrity of the data you've been storing, whether it's Amazon or anything else, um, or whether you want to make sure that uh, what you get back from Amazon 10 years from now is actually the, the same data as the one you stored 10 years ago. You know, assuming gigabytes or petabytes of information. I, I think, yes, it's important. Uh, I think more and more we are going to become um, attached to the permanent aspect of data. Uh, I think most of us were looking at data as, as a point in time. And, and that's the way we used to recover data. Right? We used to recover data at a point in time. Now I think we want to recover data permanently, all of it, forever, right? I mean, do you want to lose some of the picture on your phone? No, I, I don't think people want to lose picture. They just want to keep everything. 
And same goes for companies. Yeah. Do you see a trend where the current technology that is doing whatever blockchain is going to be replacing and blockchain will be coexisting, or you see a trend where blockchain will overtake the, the current uh, way of doing things? So that's a really good question. So I, I, I absolutely believe that blockchain is a complementary technology to what we have today. I, I think it will not replace 100% of the of the processes around the world simply because a lot of processes need to be centralized uh, you know secured in different ways in different fashion uh, i think the way you need to look at it is it's really an enhancement to to current processes <coughs> if you think of the world in terms of processes right th think about the way companies interact think about the way we interact with companies think about the way companies interact with governments <laughs> It's basically a suite of processes. Some are small processes, some are you know, extensive processes, complex processes. Blockchain will probably be 5 to 10% of those processes. It should be sent to Gartner or IDC or Forrester Research. What those guys tell you is we could optimize the world by about 5 to 10% overall by automating data through blockchain or decentralized ledger technology, which is an interesting concept. Because what blockchain does is essentially removing proxy and intermediaries. And I would argue in many industries or in dealing with governments, you have a lot of inefficiencies, not because people are useless or companies are useless, but because the service they provide is necessary today, but in some way not irreplaceable by some automated transaction. And what sits, what sits on top of blockchain is something called smart contract, which basically enables you to automate the way relationship could be done without a proxy or without an intermediary. <coughs> and this idea that you could automate, automate basic processes for invoicing, for purchasing, for submitting information, for validating information is extremely interesting. I mean, we live in a world where those processes will be automated. Right. So blockchain is one way to automate it. So it will be complementary. I'm going to try to pro no. <laughs> um, Aside from currency mining, how, what's the incentive for people to invest in all the comp computational power to do this? Um, so no interest uh, for most people, except if the use case that provides the blockchain is interesting for you right. from a business standpoint. So you could think of mostly three um, I think I'm kind of going through the presentation, so. Uh, <laughs> so you can think of mostly three main benefits um, using blockchain technology in the enterprise and in the government. Uh, the number one is, of course, cost saving, uh, simply because you're establishing something known as single source of truth, single source of truth. So you're basically eliminating uh, reconciliation from any transaction. For those of you that are in uh, financial sectors or in very process intensive industries, uh, probably five to six percent of your workforce today spend time reconciling data manually. Right. So you receive this report from you know, this intermediary or this bank or this, right? and you validate it against your, your own. So establishing single source of truth is probably the, the most common best use case of, of blockchain. Today. That's cost saving. Um, the second thing that it provides is it provides traceability. Uh, I mean, everyone agrees that basically being able to, to track how transactions are being recorded and track a history that everyone agrees to of how this transaction has been recorded could be useful in many different industries. It's, it's useful in tracking, uh, you know, proof of provenance, it's uh, 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 the cold chain for food, um, traceability for uh, just any components uh, like um, uh, uh, prescri drug prescription, etc. It's very useful to track because if you track it one way in the blockchain, you can track it the other way. So think about all those uh, drug prescription going on in the US, right? You have a lot of drugs being disseminated by a distributor from the pharmaceutical to the distributor, distributor to the retailer, retailer to. Right? 
So let's say something happens with one of those uh, drug, you know, expiration or, or wrongdoing with a particular lot. The ability to be able to track it one way, but also track it the other way, or then remove it from the market, very interesting. That's the second use case. The third use case is really this hybrid case around government and enterprise, which I think will become very common, where basically blockchain provides transparency. So what value does transparency provide? Right? I mean, how much are we willing to pay for things to be more transparent? I, I don't know. I, I think it's valuable in the context we are living in. Um, to attach a value to it is probably hard, but I think a lot of governments will be compelled to, to provide uh, better transparency to what they do so that they can have better credibility or better accountability across what, what they do. Right? Do you see blockchain adopting a cryptocurrency like Libra or Bitcoin as their standard currency? Uh, Francis won't talk so. so basically, the war for blockchain is essentially there's a, there's a lot of different competing platforms right now. There is no one coin to rule them all. Um, in terms of the adoption curve where we're currently at, it's like just before the... Um, I mean, I wasn't born in the 90s, so I don't know what the world is like. <laughs> 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 yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, the 90s. <laughs> well, basically, we're at the stage before we, first, we truly start to see the first Googles and Amazons or past, like, you know, the dot-com bubble, so to speak. There was a blockchain bubble back in 2017. You know, Bitcoin dropped from 20K down to the low 5,000 to 3,000. So basically, now it's past the hype stage, and we're really just looking for use cases that work. So, um, no, as of right now, there's no really one coin to rule the ball. Of course, there's market leaders. So, like, right now, Bitcoin is dominating cryptocurrency. But you bring up an interesting point with Libra. So the point of Libra, uh, which is basically made by Facebook, it's supposedly a cryptocurrency that gets all these corporate partners, Uber, um, I think chain, uh, yeah, Uber and a bunch of other ones. And it's, essentially, it's a cryptocurrency which you can just transact without the need for real dollars. The value in that is basically the uh, unbanked population. I think 75% of the world is currently unbanked. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially, People in developing countries can use a library cryptocurrency to access uh, goods and services from first world markets. And that's huge because the banks can service everyone. And basically what Facebook, what Zuckerberg is doing is a power move to essentially sidestep the banks and reach out to these developing markets to you know, tap into these uh, consumer bases that haven't been really exploited yet. Where's Cash Cow is waiting up there. So, um uh, I think what's interesting in your question is first we have to we have to answer the question about what is a cryptocurrency right? and whether it does exist. I mean, it does exist today. You have billions of Bitcoin being exchanged, and cryptocurrency is essentially a way for people to exchange value without government. And, and I think that's what's really interesting in the concept. Whether it's a good concept, whether people have abused it or will abuse it, I don't know. But I think the idea is that for the first time, you have people that are able to exchange some sort of value in a non-regulated way, which is kind of the case today, without the intervention of any government, is, is clearly you know, a new way of doing things. And I think that's probably what blockchain brings to, to the new world, or to this potential new use cases that Francis were talking about, the idea that you're not going to need the government to exchange some value and you're going to be able to use these values to buy or sell particular services is a very interesting idea and yes you will have many uh, currencies uh, probably for the near future you know a lot of people may not realize it but you, you're using them today for example airline miles that is a virtual currency it's not cash yeah. but it is uh, something virtual as a currency you can use to buy products and services Absolutely. or gas miles or uh, food store points or whatever and that's all a cryptocurrency it's Absolutely. not cash but it is value Absolutely. used to purchase goods and services uh, that's a very good example because the first user of uh, blockchain four years ago five years ago where airlines company <laughs> hotel chain mm -hmm. that basically so in this loyalty system a way for them to share uh, points in some more open way. And um, I, I guess what's really interesting about this particular use case is, is really around the idea that 
those those airline companies, they were credible with their own miles. Right? I mean, they, they were making you earn miles, and you could spend these miles into upgrades and updates of, of your seats and, and you know, uh, buy plane ticket. But in reality, what they really wanted to do is they wanted to make it a currency so that you can also go to any store, you can also go to any hotel and use the very same app. So came the question of credibility. You know, why my United, uh, what's a United? Uh, mileage plus. Mileage plus. Mileage plus. Yeah, <laughs> I lived in Boston, so we had JetBlue. So JetBlue had a JetBlue blue mileage, whatever. And, um, and um, um, as a credibility of those points, they were only um, uh, true and viable for people around the airline and customers of the airline. So what they did with blockchain is basically open this to different groups of people having their own nodes and network and basically agreeing that when you make one mile on you know, mileage plus, you make you know, 0 0.5 miles on mileage reward. And, and, and that's how people agree that this is a single source of truth. That's essentially what they do. Very interesting use case. I think, um, and, and John, John says that very, very rapidly, but very rightly so, I think this need for blockchain, or this use case we see, and, and the reason why everyone is so interested about blockchain and decentralized ledger technology, it's all about data. It's all about the amount of data we, as a person, are dealing with today. And the amount of data that companies need to manage, and now supposedly are responsible for. They, they need to basically um, the liable for the data we give them. And it creates this you know, big issue of how people are going to be protected and how companies protect data. And blockchain is one way to enhance this security. It's not the only way or the way. It's <coughs> one way that will probably enhance um, uh, the way data are being stored. So uh, I talk about this. So <laughs> Uh, I think it's really um, a change of mindset, and maybe that's a next that's that's a good step to to move to the next discussion. The next discussion is okay. So, essentially, blockchain is a new way to trust people. That that's what we're proposing. Like instead of having someone in the middle or someone you have to trust, like the government, basically what blockchain offers is basically a way for us to agree without anyone, or for companies to agree without anyone, but with everyone that this is the right transaction, that this is the right information, that this is not going to be changed, that this is going to be shared with such person or with such company, not with the other. So that's what blockchain is offering, a new ways for us to establish trust. Right? I think the analogy I use frequently is, you know, you know me now for about 10 minutes, and we're not friends. Right? At the end of the evening, I can probably be kind of friends with a couple of you, you know, if I do a good job, maybe five of you. Right? <laughs> like very, very different, difficult for me to, to be friends with all of you here. But if I tell you, well, the way we can be friends is basically by establishing this rule, and this rule, and this rule, and that will be the foundation of our friendship. And I can guarantee that these rules are going to be followed. You know, then you guys could, maybe not tonight, but you know, tomorrow you could say, oh, maybe that's a way for us to, to do this. That's why blockchain is proposing a new kind of trust which will be useful in some cases, not all cases, in some cases. So um, to your question, sir, uh, I think that's really the way I, I answer it. I don't think blockchain will replace or will um, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, change completely the way we behave. I think it will complement and enhance existing processes, for existing use case, for companies, for individuals, and for the government. Yes? Yeah, I just had a, like, going back to the previous slide, actually, and I have a tough time explaining my clients and my... <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get tough time explaining my clients and my executives that the trust like who defines that trust? That that's kind of a little bit confusing. That who says that this is the definition of that trust that everyone has to buy in? Yes. And 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 while you're telling that, can you also explain that whoever is defined that trust is that not becoming the central authority? That's where I get 
kind of so confused. the people defining the rules are basically the people defining um, the central authority. I mean, they replace the central authority. But the difference is that it's not one person, or it's not one group. It could be just everyone. And if you don't agree to the rule, you don't have to abide to it. So you, you're basically either okay to follow the rules, and then you're part of the rules, and you can influence it, right? Many protocols allow people to vote. And in fact, in the history of blockchain, short history, you already had protocols, protocols, algorithm, right, blockchain, yeah. that basically split. Right? Some people wanted to go one way, some people wanted to go another way. And, and that happened because there is no central authority, <coughs> but groups of people that define what they want to do. Now, how to trust? When, when I got in Singapore, um, for the first time in 97, uh, I was um, marketing a, a fantastic ERP package uh, that was bought over later by Microsoft. And the very first demonstration I made of, of this system, the accountant of that company told me, so, you know, you enter this general ledger transaction, how, how can I trust you that the system will compute properly? Uh, so that's essentially the question you're, you're, you're asking the way the transaction is going to be recorded and and the way people agree the transaction is going to be recorded the script the smart contracts is all completely transparent so if you don't agree to the rule right, you can decide not to trust it but then it's as much as basically agreeing and, and believing in, in a computer program computing some transaction and some binaries and establishing that this is the truth so that's how the trust is being established because People following the rule, uh, setting up the rules are, there could be everyone. And, uh, and the rules are written, they're transparent, they're open. So if you don't, if you don't want it, you know, you're, you're not going to be part of this particular trust circle. All right. And it, your, your transaction is not just being calculated once. Each time it goes to the node with the same consensus algorithm, it's being recalculated to validate and verify the same thing. That's true. So it, it, it's being calculated as many times as there are nodes and they all have to agree or they do not accept it. Well, technically not all of them. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. You can't have that. You can't have that. You can't have that. That's the way Bitcoin works. Would that prevent like a, a bad actor like an Iran or a China gaming the system? Would that happen? I'm sorry? Well, you talk about trust, but you know, where's the verify if there's no you know, arbiter of what's right and what's wrong? So if you get a bad actor state like an Iran or a China, how would that affect the trust? So, um, so we, we, I don't want to go too much into the political. Well, it's a reality uh, of business. I mean, uh, but, but that's political. I think, I think, um, uh, in general, uh, the actors of a of a consortium. So that's how we call a group of companies working together consortiums. It's a Latin word. And, um, and the actor of these consortiums, it could be a Chinese company, American company, French company, does not really matter. As long as you're a player, you're, you're obliged to the rule, right? That, that's the way it works. Now, um, whether people can compromise uh, a network, you know, I, I don't think it's been done a lot. Maybe it will happen, I don't know. Um, but probably not more than the way people think all systems are compromised today. So I, I think well, the rule we we agree and define as part of those consortiums or as part of those ecosystem of people working together are basically including you know, people that are agreeing to those rules, uh, and that's how the trust is being created. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. No more question. Yeah. China. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So I think one important comment that you raised that is that the you're not placing trust in the actors or the people involved in the system, but you're placing trust in the system itself. Think about this, when you drove here today, you passed many people on the road that you had no idea whether you could trust them or not, but you trusted the fact that they were all going to follow the rules and you wouldn't have somebody coming head on to you in the wrong lane. So you can think about it in the fact that it's the system that establishes the trust and makes it very difficult for bad actors to compromise the system. So for those of you that are really interested in, in this particular topic, uh, I think you have a lot you can read about what people call governance, governance of those different blockchains. Right? Because the question about 
who controls the blockchain? Because that's what we want to know, because that's the way we've been educated, right? We want to know who's responsible, right? And the fact that there is no one really responsible, it's, you know, it's bothering us, right? The most All generations, <laughs> right? Three generations, yeah. <laughs> but all generations, it's a challenge. And, and, and what's really, and what's really interesting is, and what's really interesting is, in the way those consortiums are going to be assembled going forward, that, that's also a challenge for our generation and the new generation. I mean, we're going to have to learn with different level of trust established in a different ways and probably partnering with more people than we had partnered before and in different ways. And that, that's challenging as, as you know, people for us to, to understand. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I mean, that's what it's going to do, I'm sorry. Essentially, it's going to extend existing systems. And, and that's fantastic. I mean, we, we have to look at it as a way for us to think differently. Most of the blockchain use cases you hear about today, they're probably not the blockchain use cases that will be in place 10 years from now. I think those new, amazing blockchain use cases 10 years from now will come from people that think differently about how we can partner, how we can collaborate, how we can share. And that's really when the benefits of the technology will come to place. So that's really interesting. Uh, that's probably the best definition of what is a blockchain that I could find. And then I have a couple more slides, and then we can take some more questions. But basically, you have those eight attributes of, of blockchain um, that are kind of true across uh, every network and every blockchain. So it's, it's digital. But if it's not digital, you can do anything. If you're still paper-based and you still sign documents and, and keep those documents on paper, blockchain is not going to help you a lot. Um, it's updated near real time, <laughs> which means that every transaction is arguably um, very, very difficult to, uh, <coughs> to fraud or to hack or to uh, play around with or tamper. Right? And, and that's kind of an interesting value. Um, it's chronological and time spent. That's why you can trace it. That, that's why you can actually provide transparency. That's why a lot of companies will use blockchain around auditability. Auditability of it. Um, it's cryptography. It's cri cryptographically sealed um, using 256 <coughs> encryption. This also will change, right? When better encryption will come, you know, with quantum technology and other technologies, and encryption will change in the blockchain. Uh, space as well, and that will also be interesting. Um, it's irreversible, which is both a, a strength and a weakness. Um, and uh, it uh, operates in a trustless environment. You don't need to trust anyone. You, you just need to have to trust everyone. And um, it has distributed ledger, and um, uh, the main business value is around fewer intermediaries enabling you to standardize and automate processes. Uh, I think that's, that's really the main business value. So that's eight uh, criteria. And as I mentioned earlier, it really provides a lot of benefits around data reconciliation for businesses. It's, it's super interesting and very, very valuable. Because that has a hard cost for most companies. And the time you spend validating information today. Um, it provides single version of the truth. Arguably, it provides better resilience, you know, depending on how. Resilience does not necessarily mean security means resilience, right? And uh, it's type proof, uh, very difficult to replace central authority, and, and that's a summary. I, I'm happy to share the presentation uh, if you guys uh, want to. Okay, so that's at a high level. And, and before I take your question, I, I have two more slides, just so that everyone is clear. <laughs> so, not all blockchain are equal. You have many different types of blockchain. In fact, you have about 650 today, right, operating including some in Arizona. And um, I mean build in Arizona. And uh, in general, you could basically uh, separate um, blockchain into uh, two big categories, public blockchain, blockchain and private blockchain. Most of the original um, believer in blockchain will tell you that the only use case are public blockchain, right? because it's open, it's an open source system, everyone can contribute, everyone can play around with it. And they will tell you that private blockchain are probably going to be, you know. And, and then for a few years, now people have agreed that in fact you probably live with a world where you have public blockchain 
and private blockchain and hybrid blockchain, which are basically combination of public and private. Um, and the way those blockchains are being assembled can be summarized in two sessions. They can be permissionless, which means that everyone is welcome to join the network. So tomorrow, if you want to join um, Ethereum uh, network, or if you want to join uh, Bitcoin and become a miner, you know, you're free to do so. There is no rule that you need to agree to on top of Bitcoin or Ethereum. No one is going to ask you anything about who you are. And, and you can join this network. And for the most case, in <coughs> the government space and the enterprise space, we talk about permission blockchain, which means that those protocols, they're defined for groups of people that agree to work together. And not everyone is welcome to become part of the network. And you can think of many different use cases uh, where this would be useful to disclose some information that might be public or less public. Now, each of those blockchain, depending on their uh, attributes, they, they have different benefits, right? Some of them can compute faster, some of them are very slow, some of them are free, some of them are very expensive. Like processing a transaction in Bitcoin, Francis, how much is it to process a transaction in Bitcoin today? To process a transaction in yeah. Bitcoin? Um, I don't have the exact number, but... Like roughly, we, roughly. Well, it actually depends. <laughs> so to record transaction on, on Bitcoin will will cost you um, near hundred bucks today in computing power and time etc. So you know it's expensive, it's highly secure, but very expensive. Now is it useful for everyone? No, because a lot of businesses could live with less security, but a better speed, or better scalability, or better throughput or just a different ways to process the transaction. So every blockchain today has some use case and some scenario which could be different depending on what businesses and governments are really looking for. So um, I think it's important to look at blockchain in the way you look at your data today and the way you store your data. That's a good analogy as well. Like some of the data you, know, you put in the cloud, some of the data you might keep at home into a specific hard drive, some of the data maybe you have some other ways to keep it. And, um, and blockchain is a bit the same. You're not going to use all blockchain for everything. Right? So that's, that's the openness and, and the security level and scalability. Please. Ah, five minutes. OK. Um, and in this public blockchain, uh, I use this um, uh, schema, which I think is uh, uh, super meaningful, especially for people uh, looking at it as a way to govern trust. Right? So you, you could look at public blockchain in a way you look at the way states and government works. You, you have the executive uh, part of the government, you have the legislature, you have the judiciary, which are the miners basically in charge of validating all the transactions. So those, those guys are basically the, the plumber validating that every transaction is being recorded according to what it's meant to be. And then you have the user community. So within this ecosystem, you can find you know, mandatory components depending on use cases that you're looking for. So I think that's a pretty cool way of looking at it. Um, I'm going to spare you this, and I'm going to spare you this. Um, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you what we do, because I, I, you know, I traveled uh, 20,000 miles, so I, I'm going <laughs> <I'm gonna, laughs> I'm gonna to take two minutes to tell you what I do. So Chainstack is a blockchain platform as a service. That's a company we created two years ago. What we do is essentially we provide a way for companies and governments to experiment blockchain. So we, we sit on top of the public cloud provider like Google, Azure, uh, AWS, and we allow people to, to come and deploy networks and services very, very easily so that they can experiment with multiple blockchains. So we are platform agnostic and, and blockchain agnostic. So we work with um, some barbarians names that I'm going to spare you, like Ethereum and Corda and Corum and MultiChain, which are all protocols being used by, by enterprise, mostly private permission blockchain or hybrid uh, permission blockchain. And what we do is we really make it super easy to, to, to experiment and then to scale. Right? So once you, find, once you found the right process, the right use case, you, you prototype it. Then we, we allow people to scale um, and build these networks. And 
let me uh, finish my, my talk around uh, this idea. The, the way to scale and to build this network is also something we all need to learn. Right? The idea that you invite people to collaborate with you under strict rules, I and mean, it used to be you know, business meetings and, and shaking hands and you know, writing legal contracts. So no, I think what we're looking at now is um, singling out processes or ways to do things as part of a process in supply chain management or in tracking or in finance. And basically saying, well, you know, we're, we're creating this open space where my customer or my vendor or my partners can actually come, deploy a node, validate transaction under the agreed rules that we have defined. And if you're willing to do so, please join me. <coughs> and that will give us the opportunity to, to uh, probably create amazing and extremely large ecosystem of companies collaborating together, probably more and bigger than what we've seen so far, um, with the Unilever of the world, with the Microsoft of the world, with the General Electric of the world. Those guys have huge ecosystem, but the way they collaborate with this ecosystem today is very, very top-down, right? I mean, like, I share this with you and yeah, it's going to go all the way. Now, what blockchain is proposing is essentially a, a better way to share data with the right person and with the right group of people you're looking at doing business with. So I think that's really the value of blockchain. And I hope I could um, give you some idea and indication of, uh, of what blockchain can do. And I'm happy to take some more questions. Thank you. In his picture where he had eight different points of the benefits of blockchain, one of them is irreversible. And he made a point earlier about what if it was an error and it's not reversible. The, the idea there is you create an offsetting transaction when you send them both up to equal what it, you want it to be in case you made an error. So hopefully nobody is thinking, oh, I made an error, I can't fix it, I'm not allowed to, but you can by creating a, another transaction to offset that. Right, but, and you don't hide the error. Right. It's there for everyone right. to see. Yeah. Uh, the lady in the back, and then we'll go to you. Um, this, this has to, from my perspective, has to do with the security part of it. When you talk about Bitcoin, and you talk about people going in and mining in the Bitcoin blockchain, how are they mining if it's so secure? Um, mining means computation. So what oh, those guys okay. are providing is basically huge clusters um, of servers, uh, most of the time in uh, very, very cold places, um, because it tends to be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys have a minimal productivity <laughs> to develop mining. Um, but basically those are farms, those are server farms that compute transaction and validate those transactions. Okay. That's why we call them the judiciary, because they validate the transactions. Gotcha. Yeah. So the miners are validating. Yeah. Okay. Yes, go ahead. To what extent do you see government regulation of uh, cryptocurrency trading uh, limiting the advancement of uh, blockchain technology? Okay. Um, so I, I don't think I'm really very super qualified to answer this question. Uh, I think. Sure you are. That's why you're in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let me. Uh, I think cryptocurrency is just one application. <laughs> exactly, and it's probably not the area we're focused on. But I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the fact that governments are concerned, in many ways, you know, in many countries, cryptocurrency were made outlaw and illegal by you know, government in China, for instance, made completely illegal. Now the question is, how do you make something you don't control illegal? Right. And, and that's really the question people have to ask. So I think. The regulator has to be uh, proactive, uh, I think, in the way they look at cryptocurrency as a way for people to use digital assets in some different fashion than they'd be using hard currency or, as we say, fiat currency. And I think it's a reality, going back to the you know, question of the gentleman over there, uh, I think if you acknowledge that you know, it does exist today, I don't think you're going to be able to go against it. And I'd like to come back on one point that Francis mentioned, which is important. It also opens some really interesting ideas for all the people that are unbanked. And that's about 4 billion people in the world. And of course here, in the US, you, know, you have probably very few unbanked people. But in some countries, like in Indonesia, 80% of the population is unbanked. In India, it's probably 90% of the population without any credit cards. So providing digital currency is a way for them to access maybe education and knowledge. And, and certainly product. 
Um, so that's, that has interesting value. So the regulator, I think, has to balance it depending on, on, on what they want to achieve in their markets and countries. As the use cases keep increasing and as data keeps growing exponentially, what's the sustainability of like processing power and capacity? Um, most of the use cases we work with are private permission blockchain. No issue with computation, no issue, no issue whatsoever with cost associated with our growth of network. And that will be the case for 90% of the, of the enterprise use cases. Okay, well I hate to cut off this, but uh, uh, we have a few, so... Yeah, you need to... Uh, a few we'll, we'll pass here. Uh, there we go. Uh, one more? There we go. Yeah, uh, one more. Uh, so now the demo part. Welcome back to the demo. My name is Francis Mendoza and I'll be demonstrating the GPEG Ethereum Ambassador Event DAP. The purpose of this DAP is to purchase an ERC20 standard GPEG Ambassador Event Sponsor token via a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. Our sponsor fee is currently 0.001 Ether. We've currently purchased two tokens before the start of this demo and we have a total circulating supply of 750,000 sponsorship tokens. As on, you can see on the bottom, you can see our address, our Ethereum address, which is linked to an extension called MetaMask, which you can install on the Opera, Firefox, and Chrome browsers. MetaMask is essentially an interface with your Ethereum wallet and the web. As you can see, that is our current Ethereum balance, and it also stores the successful and failed transactions to the Ethereum blockchain. Now, we're going to attempt to purchase some tokens of our own. We're going to purchase, let's say, around 10 tokens. So the MetaMask window is going to pop up, and there are two fees. So the first is the actual cost of the tokens, and the second is a gas fee, which is basically a transaction fee required to write onto the Ethereum blockchain itself for a total of 0 0.06 Ether. So we're going to write that. It is that simple. Uh, one of the reasons I also wanted to show you this is uh, our commitment here um, at Acronis SES is really to help uh, work with Arizona to become that uh, silicon desert. Uh, this is really basic, still some complexity. Uh, there's a lot more we can do over time. Uh, Francis here is actually an intern with us, who's at ASU, I assume from the, the shirt, uh, who uh, it will, is a blockchain expert, if you hadn't noticed, and, and no passion at all. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, is actually not completely, like I said, is in somewhat of the scope of a Cronus SES, but I felt it was important to have someone here to really help uh, develop this technology and understanding of that. Uh, with that, um, uh, I think that's it, right? Welcome, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, well. I want to welcome Chris. Uh, does everyone know Chris? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Who is he? <laughs> Come on up, Chris. Thank I'll you. let you take it from here. Thanks uh, to John and the uh, Cronus SES team for allowing us to partner on this event. Since we all feel so comfortable with blockchain after tonight, we've decided to take all the JPEG dues and put it in the room, and we're going to roll the dice. So, uh, kidding on that. Everybody's tweeting on that point. Um, also, Francis, you might get a kick out of this. I had a chance a couple years ago to meet uh, Vitalik from Ethereum. So, I knew that was going to So, you know, the founder of Ethereum is like the Albert Einstein of our generation. Is that fair? Yeah. So, I mean, that's what the, the cool kids tell me. So uh, it's interesting being in a, in a state where we are uh, advancing our market position on emerging technology. If anybody's following the news, over the last week we've launched a campaign in California, uh, this little quiet campaign called California Struggles. Uh, and it really talks about the heart of the challenges of operating, scaling a new enterprise in California, which uh, ultimately allows us, this is a secret sauce, allows us to pivot into the Pro Phoenix message. And so just this last week alone, we did uh, Fox Business, we did Inc. Magazine. Uh, tomorrow, or Friday, we're doing some other, um, Bloomberg, I think it's Friday. Uh, and I can tell you, just this week, we've, we've placed two billion in media impressions on the Greater Phoenix Value Proposition. So pretty cool, just in the last week, being able to tell our story. We can't tell our story without companies like, like John's and, and Sergey's uh, investment here, so we thank you very much for that. And I can tell you, this year we're going to close our year with around 55 new companies uh, coming to the market. And it's really unique that I go back 11 years in my first year at GPEC, and 
Go back to 2008, remember that? Not such a great time. Uh, our market has transformed itself uh, largely because the, the leadership that's many of you that are in the room on the private side, but also uh, I know Chandler left, I see AJ and many others here. The ability for our system to work in a public-private partnership is absolutely critical. And, and I hope over the next quarter, I said this to a California reporter, I probably shouldn't have said this, so I set the expectation. We should be announcing some of the most exciting projects in the last two years should happen in our next quarter. That's what's in the pipeline. We had one in yesterday, top 20 brand globally, and we're so close to making a major announcement with this major manufacturing uh, facility. So the other example, and it was kind of covered already, so I won't go back to it, but we entered into a smart contract tonight to just to showcase Sharon said, we have to do something related to blockchain if we're going to be at this event. I said, well, what should we do? And my, my idea was Ethereum transfer. That didn't go well. So instead, we entered into this partnership. And, and so thanks for allowing us to showcase what this can actually do. And one other thing I wanted to mention tonight uh, that I think is really important and has been a little bit overlooked in that this last legislative session, uh, we were able to, with, with folks like Wes Golett, who's here, uh, John, who actually did speak to the, the uh, Senate President. I was actually at the dinner. He, just, he did a great job, too. So he's, he's fooling you in that he didn't, he didn't feel confident in that response. Uh, this, is a, this is a very difficult state to advance innovation-related policy because it's risk <laughs> capital. <laughs> Uh, we can all joke about it now because 11th hour wasn't really funny, was it? So uh, Wes and one of our other uh, folks working on our behalf down at the Capitol, uh, we were able to eke through a, a blockchain institute investment, which is a public-private partnership between the state of Arizona, uh, industry, and universities in our state. And we also were fortunate enough to get a second level investment with the Wearable Technology Institute, which would be placed at Park Central. So we're beginning this, this transformation of technology largely driven by folks like John and others that went down to the Capitol with us, talked about emerging technologies. We're talking about nations, nascent spaces that are disruptive, and yet if we don't play in this space, we're going to miss major technology opportunities that transform our ecosystem as we know it. And so that's why we have to continue to work as an army of GPEC ambassadors and GPEC partners to be down at the Capitol working together. I'll tell you, this is not easy work. Uh, but I do feel the fruits of the labor is, is certainly being felt. And we're going to double down over the next five years to continue to sell our brand, elevate our reputation, and, and continue to make continued intentional investments to make this place the greatest place in the U.S. to launch a company and scale a company. So with that, I want to thank, for that. thank John for the opportunity for hosting us tonight. I still can't believe we didn't break fire code with everyone in the room. But somehow we pulled it off, so thanks again, John, for the opportunity. My pleasure.